Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Chrisum, and I'd like to invite you to a conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experience. And uh, before we get started with that conversation, there's a few announcements that I think we should be making. First of all, is Santara. She is having some technical difficulties uh, getting into the studio here. And so we're just going to to carry on, and hopefully she'll be able to join us as soon as that's uh, possible for her. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have a seminar coming up uh, on the, the 18th, 19th, and 20th of uh, October. This will be in Dublin, and uh, for information, you can call Amelia Centara. Uh, at kundalini matters at gmail dot com so that 's kundalini matters at gmail dot com and uh, she 'll be able to to guide you through that very very simple process. I would like to congratulate those who have already uh, made their arrangement to come and I look forward to seeing all of you all of you who uh, who are in europe or or who can make it. Uh, to Ireland. Ireland is not that far away if you live on the east coast of the United States. So, you know, it's what they call flying across the pond, I believe is how they term it. So maybe uh, some of you on the east coast can fly across the pond over to Dublin and and have a beautiful short uh, uh, holiday or long holiday in the uh, beautiful country of Ireland. Uh, I think that, you know, having been there, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And one of the one of the best things about Ireland, in my opinion, is is that they don't tear down their ancient castles. They they don't necessarily uh, rebuild them, but you get a lot of the, the ancient, uh, well, not ancient, but you know, you get some castles over there that are you know a thousand years old or more, and uh, so those are always fun to visit. Uh, so I would I would strongly recommend that people come over to Ireland, uh, you know, certainly for the Kundalini Awakening Seminar, but also for for the many other options uh, for enjoyment that Ireland holds for people. Uh, we'll be having the uh, seminar right near uh, an extremely ancient uh, Irish. Uh, uh, it's a it's a it's complex of scenarios that. Not only is it a burial chamber, uh, but it also holds other other secrets that uh, you know aren't being released. I've been into a lot of these burial chambers, uh, you know, in different parts of Europe and in Ireland, and uh, they they are very very psychically intact spaces. So a person can go into these to these mounds and and actually contact some of the intention for which they were placed. Let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and, and begin. You can call in any time uh, with, at the show here. The uh, It's a United States area code, so you would dial 1 and then 347-934-0026. So if you have any question about your Kundalini Awakening experience, um, any question at all, uh, if I can if I can help you, I will most certainly help you, and I encourage you to call in at three four seven nine three four zero zero two six. So there we have it. It looks like we have a few people on board. So I would like to say hello to Julie Celestial Rubies and and uh, guest two one five two, guest two 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 seven, and guest two two four two. Hello everyone, and I know. I know you're listening as well, Amelia, so hello to you, and hopefully you can you can join us here in the studio. Uh, today's topic of the Kundalini Awakening uh, experience uh, is, is going to be a bit, it's going to cover more than one area. And one of the first areas that we really need to cover is the area of, of surrender. It sounds easy. Oh, I surrender to the Kundalini. Oh, I surrender to the Kundalini teacher and my Kundalini. Oh, I surrender, surrender. And it's not, it's just not that easy to do because it it goes into areas of life that our ego will tenaciously hold on to. 
and I mean tenaciously hold on to it. Um, I walk a, a fine line uh, when it comes to being a the kind of kundalini teacher that I am. I am not a kundalini yoga teacher. Uh, for kundalini yoga, I will recommend Sukhmander Singh Khalsa uh, out of uh, the area of Monterey, California. And Sukhmander Singh Khalsa, uh, it, you can just Google his name and, and, and his contact info will come up. And, and I will suggest that he is the only one that I will recommend for kundalini uh, yoga. Uh, Sukhmander Singh Khalsa has a strong lineage. He is, uh, um, he's had kundalini for quite some time and he has a very positive and direct approach, uh, within the kundalini yoga system of, of kundalini awakening. So for those of you who are interested in kundalini yoga, I will suggest that you, you, uh, you Google Sukhmander Singh Khalsa and that is spelled S U K. M A N D E R and Singh is S I N G H and then Kalsa is K A L S A Kalsa. So for Kundalini Yoga, check out Sukhmander Singh Kalsa or as we call him S S K. And uh when you contact him he can he can direct you into the appropriate areas uh where where he does his teaching. Oh, it looks like Centaur is on. I'm gonna bring Centaur on here. Hello, hello, Santara. Hi, Chris. And apologies to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will. Yeah. I will let you. I will let you go with your announcements. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> okay, if I may just catch my breath. <laughs> right. Um. Oh goodness me. Okay. Well, maybe I could begin with the seminar. Um. To let you all know that there is a Kundalini Awakening seminar happening in Dublin and it is for all of Europe it's not just for people in Ireland because really we are part of Europe and to fly to Ireland is is a very short trip from almost anywhere really in in Europe and there's an airline uh, Ryanair that are extremely good value so the fact that it's in Dublin and you're living in Europe and you know that's to me I want to encourage you to come because it's a very short trip and the, the seminar itself is going to be located not in Dublin, but in County Meath, which is only 30 minutes from Dublin Air, um, Airport, and it's in the Boyne Valley. And the Boyne Valley, um, you know, has a lot of um, amazing monuments there, Newgrange being one of them. And the venue for the seminar is in that area. And apparently on our first night, oh, let me tell you, it's on the 18th, 19th, and 20th of October. And on our first night, um, there is going to be uh, an eclipse, a lunar eclipse. So I think that's somehow very fitting <laughs> indeed. So we begin on the Friday night at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m., and we run right through until Sunday at 4 p.m. When we, when we finish. So there's going to be transport arranged from people who are arriving into Dublin. So um, if you want to get in contact with me about any aspect of the seminar, please do. And my number is, I'll give you my phone number as well. If you're ringing outside Ireland, it's 00353-860297676. And you can also contact me by email, and that's kundalinimatters at gmail.com. So I would really encourage those of you who are living in Europe to try and make it if you can, because Chris doesn't come here that often. So this is a wonderful opportunity to meet with him, to meet with a, a Kundalini Awakened teacher. Um, I know that for me, it has made a huge difference. You know, it was a few years ago when I decided to go to my first um, gathering with Chrism, and it was, you know, it, it made a huge difference to my awakening. It changed my life in so many ways and, and brought such grace to my, to my process. And I know that most people, actually everybody who comes to a seminar feels this way. To meet with other Kundalini people as well, you know, it's not something that happens every day. So that's another aspect of it. Um, 
sometimes it can be isolating um, to be a Kundalini awakened person and it's, it's just wonderful to meet others that are going through the same process. So really, you know, if you're listening to this or if you have any urge from your Kundalini, if you're being communicated to, to perhaps consider this, I, I would say to you really consider it. Um, get in contact with me. Any questions at all that you might have on any issues, be it transport, cost, um, where it is, the times, you know, the dates again, please just just send me an email to, again, I'll give you that email address. It's kundalini matters at gmail.com. And it would be wonderful to meet you there. It's only, I think, three weeks away now, Chris, and almost. <laughs> can, can you give so, them your phone number again? I can. It's zero zero three five three eight six zero two nine seven six seven six. So that's um that's about it for the seminar. I'd like to say a little bit as well about donations if I may and give that place on the web on the internet that you can go to. Um you know, please know that donations are given. Uh, to Chrism for the work that he does for his time and um, they are never given as a purchase of divinity or, or of Shakti Pass. It's always about supporting Chrism in the work that he does. Um, so please, if you're in a position to do that or you feel you would like to do that, I'm going to give you the, the address now. It's www.ascension-kundalini dot blogspot.com and there's a donate button up at the top right hand corner of that page and I'll give it to you again www.ascension hyphen kundalini dot blogspot dot com thank you thank you Amelia oh okay so uh looks like we lost uh Amelia right at the uh Right at the end of her of her announcements, well, we'll we'll hope that she she's able to make it back. Uh, about the donations, uh, when it comes to divinity or Shakti Pot, which is the introduction of divinity into a person, there is no money that can even be initiated into any of of those processes. It is not appropriate, and the Kundalini itself. It's, it's very clear to me about that. And so, no, I will never, ever take money for a Shakti pot or any kind of divine uh, uh, communication or, or experience that a person is having uh, through their contact with me. The only thing that I'm allowed to take donations for really are the teachings and the time, uh, you know, travel expenses, thing, things of that nature. But uh, as far as Shakti pot goes, no, 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 those are always free. And uh, they are based upon an individual's practice of the safeties, the safety protocols that you can reach at www.kundaliniawakeningsystems1.com. You'll see the safeties uh, in the left-hand menu, about the fourth or fifth one down. You'll see the safeties and just press on that and then feel free to to uh, copy that, to make hard copies of the safeties. The Shakti pot will always be predicated upon the safeties unless the Kundalini is using, you know, it's, it's a different scenario such as in healing or or some other uh, aspect of uh, the Kundalini awakening experience that the Kundalini intends to bring to an individual. Okay, that being said, uh, oh, the other thing is, is, is uh, don't... I've had this happen lately, so I have to mention it, and I apologize for wasting your time with it. Uh, don't give me a donation and then and then want to have the Shakti pot and then for whatever reason change your mind and then ask for the donation back because you're not taking the Shakti pot for whatever reason. I mean, that – yeah, so really uh, re resist doing that type of thing. I would appreciate it. With regards to this uh, conversation that we're going to have today, I want you to really start looking at the idea of surrender in your life. Not surrendering to an enemy or surrendering to somebody who is uh, uh, dominating you in some egocentric way. I'm talking about surrendering 
the control that your ego has over your kundalini awakening process. And, you know, we're not talking about just one slender aspect of your life. We're talking about a major aspect of your life and and an aspect of living and life that permeates all areas of living and life. And and so really have a look at surrender. And if you're a mucho macho individual, look to see how you're handling surrender, the, even the concept of surrender in your life. Look to see how that works for you, whether or not that that you can... You know, you can honestly come into that type of a scenario. Look at that and and, and honestly gauge uh, how, how you feel about surrender. Now, it's, it's one thing to surrender to an omnipotent force, which is what the Kundalini is. Uh, it's omnipotent and yet it doesn't speak to you in a language that you'll always understand because it always wants you to learn, 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 surrender, 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 transform, transform, transform. And part of that transformation is learning how to uh, receive the instructions from the Kundalini in the way that it gives it to you, not in the way that you're used to accepting information. So have a look at that. Ah, looks like Centaur is back here. Centaur? Hello. Hi, Chris. So, so, oh, I see. Is there anything else that you wanted to say? Um, No, there's not. All right, my dear. Thank (laughs) you for the announcements. Okay. All right, so let's look at the idea of surrender. When when I talk about surrender with you, I'm talking about complete and total surrender of the control of your life, of the processes of your life, the relationships in your life, the belief systems in your life, and and your inner dialogue that you have with yourself, which is basically typically between you and your ego. The inner dialogue uh, needs to become one of surrendering to the kundalini or surrendering to the teacher that your kundalini has guided you to. Now, I understand that because I'm putting on this show, uh, one could interpret, interpret that anybody listening to the show has been guided by their kundalini to accept me as their teacher. And that's just not the case. That is not the case. And I am I have no expectations of anybody out there uh, being a student or becoming a student of mine simply because they're listening to this show. What I am uh, supportive of is a person who has the kundalini or is seeking the kundalini and is in enough communication with the kundalini that they can begin to follow the guidance that the kundalini brings. Now, if indeed that kundalini within you has guided you to be here, then I'm going to strongly suggest that you accept it as as that being the fact of the matter. So I really want you to accept that as being the fact of the matter. The Kundalini wants you to have this information. Now, if it keeps bringing you uh, uh, to a specific teacher, uh, then I'm going to suggest that you begin to to look seriously about becoming a student of that that teacher. I don't teach. Well, let me let me back up a little bit. There is some similarity between uh, many of the teachers out there that are teaching Kundalini. They all recognize it as an energy. They all recognize it. Well, not all of them, but some of them recognize it as an energy with a consciousness. Um, some of the teachers, if they're martial arts oriented, uh, it be, you know the Kundalini gets turned into a weapon or as a way to dominate an enemy, things of that nature. Um, that has a, a typically low level of, of uh, ascension within it uh, because it's being used as a way of domination, uh, domination being an action of the ego, an action of the ego being not in harmony with the actions of the kundalini. 
Uh, so you need to look at that. Uh, you can come into Kundalini through severe prayer, uh, religion, through severe uh, accident or physical trauma, um, Shaktipat, which is transference of Kundalini from one person to another. Uh, the, uh, even just reading material on the Kundalini can can begin to activate an individual who is actually being called to to partake of that information. So when you're dealing with Kundalini and the idea of surrender, you want to understand that there is no such thing as an accident anymore in your life. You do not get to have that luxury. I mean, it's it's really luxurious to say, oh, my gosh, you know, I was making a lane change. I don't know if my blinker was on. And, you know, we had this. It was an accident, officer. Really, it was an accident. Well, with Kundalini, you don't get to say that. You know, the Kundalini officer is the Kundalini itself, and the Kundalini is basically – guiding you to hear this information that there are no longer any real accidents in your life. Now, there are, there are, you know, chaos does exist. And, you know, Kundalini can pull from chaos, whatever it wants. But for you, there's always going to be a level of teaching and transformation from your Kundalini to you 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is not a subtle energy. It is sometimes, but typically when the kundalini comes into a person, it, it shakes them to the very foundation of their soul. And that shaking and that and that uh, that shock and awe, so to speak, as the as the kriyas come or the entities come or whatever phenomena associated with the kundalini comes to a person, uh, that will get your attention. And once your attention is is given, then you have an opportunity to really begin to surrender. Once you get past the fear, you know, the fear of the shock and awe that it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I can see people's thoughts. I can hear people's inner inner dialogue. I can do all these different things. And yet, you know, you know, what is it that's really happening to me? Well, you can know. You can know that that you're having the kundalini. If you have at least three or more of the typical kundalini symptoms, dreaming of snakes or, or having visions or, you know, pain at the, at the base of the, of the uh, tailbone or at the, in the, in the pelvic region, pulsating of energy up the spine. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. You know, if you start looking at that, you go, okay, I have this, I have that, and I have this. You can start to add the the Kundalini arithmetic tick up, and and determine where you are within an activation of the Kundalini. Then, then I w- I would strongly suggest you begin to surrender yourself to it. Kundalini is the hand of God upon you. It is the hand of the divine upon you. It is the hand of Buddha, of Christ, of Allah, of Zoroaster, of of uh, Zeus, Hera, Kuan Yin, everybody that's been a divine uh, personage among the human beings of this planet uh, can occupy, doesn't necessarily always occupy, but can occupy a place within the Kundalini awakening experience of an individual. Okay, so... When you come into that understanding, you come into the understanding that Kundalini is the touch of grace, of divine grace upon the person. Then you can begin to surrender to that. And then wherever that divine grace guides you to to a teacher for yoga or Kundalini yoga, let's just say a teacher or, or, or the Kundalini in you is guiding you to to partake in Kundalini yoga. Okay. And so the Kundalini guided you to come to this or to listen to this interview today, whether you're listening in the archives, and hello all of you listening in the archives, or if you're listening live, as, as many of you are, and I, and I see you, I can't read what you're writing. Uh, yeah. So then, as the Kundalini guides you to say to, to Kundalini Yoga, then, of course, I would suggest you go see Sukhmander Singh Khalsa. Um, 
and, and his organization down there in Monterey. But he also does televised things where he shows you the very short televised sequences that that are lasting five to ten minutes that you can do as you watch them on the on your on your computer. You can do these at home as well, and I think they'd be very conducive to your Kundalini Awakening experience. So as you surrender to the point, you get past the shock and awe, you finally determine that, oh, my gosh, this all fits the Kundalini. All my symptoms fit the Kundalini, and we're talking at least three or more symptoms. Then you can begin your surrendering process. And the surrendering process basically means that that you're listening to your Kundalini before you listen to your ego. So you walk, you, you get up in the morning, your typical routine is that you go to, uh, you go to your little ca- corner cafe and you, you have a hot drink and you have a bagel. Let's just say you're a bagel person and you have a bagel. I've been accused of being a bagel person myself, so I just want you to know. I speak from experience, authentic experience. So the scenario is, Kundalini comes, you know, comes to you and says, "No more bagels for you. You you can't have any more bagels until I tell you otherwise." And and that could be for years. You won't be able to have a bagel for years. And you obey that. You obey that inner teaching, even to the point where you say, "I obey," to that Kundalini, to that force of Kundalini within you, or to your Kundalini teacher, or whoever it is that the Kundalini is guiding you towards. The reason why I, I counsel people to say I obey is because it it has a signature in our society of a forced, a forced um, surrender to a person. Or you know, in the United States, we have this strong history of slavery in the country, and and the whole obey word has that patina of slavery around it. And the only reason I like to use it is because it is, in, in the States, at least the United States, there's a harsh uh, aspect to the idea of saying, I obey to anybody. Okay, But for the Kundalini, it's a very, very good level of surrender because really with the Kundalini, you don't have any other choice. You might think you do. You know, For those of you who are early in your process and your ego is going, what about me? You know, the ego is really dancing around with the waving the arms going, you know, what about me? Notice me. Notice me. Let me take control of your life. Well, that won't happen very much anymore. And and there will be a contact or a conflict between the kundalini and your ego. And, and, And as you begin to observe and feel the dynamics of this conflict, you'll pretty much get the handle of it you know the the ego is going to want to have a control or a say in everything that you do and the kundalini won't necessarily want you to pay attention to the ego in that regard and so when i say surrender you're surrendering your ego and the likes and dislikes of the ego to the kundalini energy itself and if you have a kundalini awakened teacher then you will surrender similarly to that teacher and this this you know this whole physical teacher this this brings up a whole can of worms okay uh or shall we say a can of fizzy snakes <laughs> anyway the scenario with a physical teacher is is we're taught in the west the western uh democracies and and uh pseudo democracies uh, that you never give in, you never surrender, you never give control over yourself to another living human being. And, and a lot of belief systems echo that quality. And it's because uh, people have been abused so often uh, by, by, uh, by teachers or leaders. Uh, and so uh, because of the, the frequency of that type of abuse, uh, you know, people are guided uh, through different uh, belief systems to stay away from any kind of corporeal or physical teaching uh, system or, or teaching arrangement. But the Kundalini doesn't really care about your fears of being dominated by a teacher or abused. But first of all, the Kundalini won't let that occur to you. 
number one. You know, unless you have that karma. And if you have that karma, then you're going to probably be abused in some other way before you even get to the awakened kundalini teacher. Okay, you're going to, that, that karma is going to have to be balanced. But with the flesh teacher, you have to understand that that flesh teacher is also being guided and instructed by their own kundalini into how to teach you, uh, personally teach you. You have to remember that that kundalini is very unique to each person. It doesn't happen the same way to anyone. Just the same way that a person's irises or fingerprints or genetic blueprint are unique to that individual. Well, so is the sequence of energetic uh, transformation the kundalini brings to a person. So is that just as unique as any kind of biometric measuring that that our society is able to do at this point. Okay, and so your teachings within uh, the levels of uh, phenomena that you may be experiencing or you might experience in the future uh, is 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 unique to you. Now kriyas are you know kriyas are automatic uh, positions that the body's forced to to have as the kundalini, uh, you know, instructs it or, or flows through a person. Uh, so the kundalini will take control of your body and give you pain if you resist. Similarly, if you, if, if you disrespect or you, you uh, decide to, to not follow your kundalini's uh, advice about a living teacher, well, then similarly, the kundalini, there may be some blowback for you in that area as well. Uh, many times with the living teacher, surrendering to a living teacher, uh, people are having to really, really um, cancel out the admonitions of society, uh, everything that your parents told you not to do. Well, you know, sometimes kundalini will tell you to do that. Uh, not to the detriment of your soul or to the detriment of anybody else around you or to the detriment of your own personal process, uh, mainly to the glorification of the transformation that this process has for you. And that means getting rid of ego-based fears and concerns. Think about that. Ego-based fears and concerns, of which... Uh, giving your, giving control of your life to a, to a physical Kundalini awakened teacher would, that would give your ego pause for concern. And it should. And it should because that ego looking at that teacher is going, wait a minute. What, where do I fit in with that? And they don't fit in so well. <laughs> they, they fit on the, they fit in on the level of being retrained to to listen to the kundalini and to do as the kundalini tells tells that ego to do. Okay. And that kundalini within the individual is guiding that individual to a certain flesh teacher. Flesh teacher offers things that that dead teachers or or uh, um surrendering to a to an energy uh doesn't really give a person a living teacher is the only thing that can give or the only individual who can give uh, levels of kundalini the way that the kundalini in, in some people want them to have it. They need to have the, the shaktipat or the proxipat, you know, receiving kundalini by being in proximity uh, to an awakened teacher. And this is also, I think, you know, some of the basis of diksha, is to just be in the presence and receive the blessing of that teacher as you're in the presence of that teacher. And this may be what your Kundalini awakening experience requires you to have and to do. And I'm going to suggest that you do it. Not necessarily with me. You do it with the teacher that your Kundalini is guiding you towards, not your ego. Okay, sometimes you need to look at your ego and, and kind of go, okay, where's the ego guiding me to? Well, the ego's guiding me to uh you know that 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 teacher over teacher number one over there well i I would suggest that you go away from teacher number one because that's the ego pick 
and you pick that which the Kundalini is highlighting for you to 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 learn from. And that teacher may just have the quality of information that your Kundalini wants you to learn. And in my case, you know, I'm very, very, very strong with surrender. This is the way I see it is I've had to surrender a hundred percent to my Kundalini. I have been forced through very, very difficult trial and error, <laughs> mostly error in my case, uh, to learn what it is to surrender myself completely and totally to the Kundalini. You know, I live my life on the edge of what most people would consider a disaster. You know, I don't have a steady home. I don't have steady transportation. I don't have uh, health care. I don't have dental care. I don't have a steady work. I depend on these donations for food. And, you know, throughout this whole thing, the kundalini in me is saying, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. And just the same way that it will teach anyone how to surrender or how to to come into the, the kundalini in a way that the person is allowed to to understand surrender, to experience surrender, um, I will suggest that that uh, everything is okay with you no matter what occurs. Uh, kundalini doesn't try to get you to hurt other people. So if some entity is inside you calling itself kundalini and it says, oh, you know, I want you to say something slanderous about this person or that person. That's not kundalini talking. Divinity doesn't have those conversations with, with, the, with the individual. It doesn't. It will have a conversation saying you need to be for, forgiving, more forgiving. You need to be more uh, uh, tolerant, uh, more patient, more truthful, uh, less ambiguous. You need to do more exercise. You need to eat this food or that food. You need to pray or to meditate or to have sex or don't have sex. You need to get outside in nature. I mean, the Kundalini will talk with you about all these different levels of surrender. But it's up to you to do them. Some of it will be enforced. I have to I can't say that it's all you that you have a hundred percent choice. You had a hundred percent choice before you took the body that was going to have the potential for kundalini awakening in this lifetime. If you're lucky enough to have that body and you're lucky enough to be to be in the process of kundalini awakening, uh, you have no more choice. You have no more choice. Choices have all been made and you are living those choices right now. Kundalini doesn't come to people accidentally. A lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of prayer, a lot of meditation, a lot of right actions have had to take in place in that person's spiritual evolution for them to even be able to reach for the Kundalini in this lifetime. And so for those of you that are reaching for it and that it, that it has already reached, you have no more choice. You're, well, I, I, I take that, but you have one choice. You can, like, resist or not resist. If you resist, it can hurt you. If you don't resist, it can enlighten you. Now, to me, that's a no-brainer type of choice. But <laughs> if I think back, you know, 20 years, you know, and I was in the fourth year of my, of my uh, awakening that I didn't know was an awakening, it can be traumatic, those choices. And, and in the fourth year of my kundalini, I just said, forget this. You know, I'm going to pay attention to what I like to do and what I want and, you know, making money and, and uh, you know, having a, a wild social life and doing all these different things that, that, uh, that a person would do. So... Um, for those of you who are hearing this teaching now, you don't have to go this route. You do not have to have that trauma. You do not have to have that level of, of difficulty 
uh, given into your Kundalini awakening experience. You can have it much better. Take the teaching of surrender seriously. Give yourself 100% to the Kundalini. Talk with the Kundalini just the same way that you would talk with a close, dear friend or family member. Communicate with the Kundalini and allow that communication to signal your surrender to God as God in, 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 in the divine form that God is reaches into your body and begins to transform your body and transform your ego and transform your mind and transform the opportunities that the Kundalini awakened person receives within the early uh, parts of the process. Uh, for those of you that might have a, have a question about their Kundalini awakening experience, please call this number, uh, United States Area Code 347 Nine three four zero zero two six, and if you're we outside have a caller, of your... oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, we have a caller. <laughs> Hello, caller. Hello, Marilyn. Oh, hey, hey hello, Marilyn. Do you remember me? Hi, I remember you. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? Very well, thank you. How many a... assist? Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Marilyn, please. I, I have a few questions. I don't know if you want me to reintroduce myself to your listeners or not, but we did speak a couple of weeks ago. I had a major DNS after a major Kundalini, Kundalini awakening 20 years ago. It was okay. a spontaneous awakening that, that came through another person, but it, he wasn't aware of it Uh he was unconscious of, of, of what came through to him, and uh, it, w it was a full-blown awakening to me. Um, just to remind you, your listeners, but I, what I'm wondering, one of the things I'm wondering about you, Chrism, is who was your Kundalini teacher, or was yours a spontaneous awakening? Spontaneous makes it all sound like it happened all at once. Um, for Mine me, did. <laughs> Well, it, it can feel that way when you when you have an awakening and you know it's accompanied by a spinal sweep and you know you have this this tremendous level of energy flow into your body and it changes your mind it changes your your outlook on life it it does a lot of major changes all at once within the person uh, and they think that oh it's full blown and well it isn't it's just starting it only right. feels full blown because because the person has never had that type of thing occur to them before. And Absolutely, so it, it, I agree. Right, right. And so Kundalini is never full blown while you still have a body. Exactly. I agree with that. Okay. I understand. The body the body is constantly transforming due to the to the uh to the effect of Kundalini upon it. And so uh with regards to that, my my Kundalini is still transforming me. But did you have a teacher that get had, you shocked? I had, I, I, boy, I tell you, I wanted a teacher. In my in my early uh, awakening, I was looking for a teacher. I needed a teacher, and I knew I needed a teacher. And the Kundalini just wouldn't let me find one. It wouldn't even let me find books on it for the first few years. I had no idea what to do except uh, resist. <laughs> so I... <laughs> so I just kept resisting. So, so I, you know, I, I know of what I speak when I talk of resistance. <laughs> I'm very clear about what it is to resist. Now, but for me, uh, the 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 transformation is continuous. It's just what happens during the transformation is a person becomes acclimated to a phase of the transformation that occurs, and then the kundalini gently or abruptly moves them into the next phase. So let's just say the first phase would be uh, kriyas. So you go through the kriyas, and, you know, this can last anywhere from from a week to five years, depending on the individual, okay? And then there are qualities of kriyas. There are, there are automatic positioning kriyas, and then there are electrical kriyas. And the two different sets of kriyas are absolutely different to 
to a degree that I find hard to to describe. Except one Korea will put you in odd-looking uh, positions of yoga, whether or not you've studied yoga. And the other form of Kriya, the electrical th- Kriya, will just throw you across the room. You'll literally be airborne out of your chair, flying across the room, and hopefully there's not a wall too close to you. <laughs> Maybe you should arrange to have some cushions. I've had both of these types of Kriyas, and I know people that are having uh, both of those types of Kriyas at this point, too. And that level of of, of surrender is choiceless really you don't really get to 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 not surrender to the uh to the electrical kriya or the other the uh, positioning kriyas um so yeah i uh, i didn't have a teacher until uh 2005 and then i didn't really have a teacher because the man was a martial artist his name was glenn morris Nice guy, really nice guy. Got along well with him. He he spent some time at our at my family's uh place on the coast out here in Northern California. Um I went to a couple of his seminars. I helped him organize one. Um, he could only take me as far as his martial arts training could take him. And I automatically knew that because I wasn't a martial artist uh, I did not have those types of parameters uh, enforced on me by a school of martial arts or a or a system of martial arts, but he did, and so he could only give me as much as he was able to give me uh, with regards to his his experiences. Um, and he was also a real profit oriented individual. I mean, he would charge six hundred dollars for a shakti pot and. You know, when I sat back to back to him, I ended up giving him a shakti pot. So no, I, I didn't. I didn't receive shakti pot from anyone uh, except the kundalini. But you know, my my awakening. I don't go into it too much because there's a lot of of uh, difficulties uh, that that people typically don't have to go through unless they're really focusing on on resisting which is of course what i was doing early on and so you don't hear me uh, explain too much about that because of that because it just gives people the wrong example so no not not much in the way of teaching uh until i read gopi krishna's account and then i knew exactly what was occurring with me and then i surrendered to it because i saw that gopi krishna he was doing the same thing I was doing, resisting every step of the way. And as you read his book, uh, uh, The Evolutionary Energy in Man by Gopi Krishna, that's his autobiography, uh, you can see that because of his resistance, the Kundalini was about ready to kill him. And it was, if it wasn't for his wife dipping uh, small pieces of bread in milk, he would have died because of his resistance because he was already he was already on his death's bed when she was dipping that milk in or dipping the bread in milk yes i'm familiar with his story yeah I, yeah yeah um i had a, a it's very interesting but i had a, a similar awakening in a sense that it was the kundalini itself that was my teacher uh somewhat through intuition somewhat through a divination tool of, of the I Ching. but to me um, and it's, I found it's a very a difference between a yin force and a yang force. Uh, a yang force might tend to resist. I had no resistance. Mine was a choiceless surrender. And I didn't have any of the, the painful things that you endured, I don't think. But I did have pain. It seemed very purposeful pain rather than just resistance. Um, because I didn't have any resistance. For some reason, I knew this is what I, this is what I had to do. This was what I was. It was a choice to surrender. There was there was no question. Um, and that's interesting. But I think it's different between a, a strong Yang force and a, a strong and a Yin force. That that uh, in, in terms of the reaction to the Kundalini. 
Well, do, I mean, do, do you if, find if that? You're, if you're if if you're a man, that you're you're going to respond in a in a yang force, and if you're a woman, you'll respond in a yin type of way. I mean, the genders do carry with them a doctrine of signature, and so of course, uh, with me being a male, and uh, you know being given the option or lack of options with regard to surrender, then of course, like Gopi Krishna, you know, I will just resist and resist and resist until. One, I can figure it out, or two, somebody explains it to me, or three, you know, it, you know, it kills me. So, I was quite into resistance as a as a natural response that that I have been, you know, trained to respond in that way by the society. Whereas you, uh, Marilyn, you may have just taken the same thing, but taken it, you know, within the uh, the uh, the expression of a of a of the feminine. So. Yes, and the you feminine, I, I don't always equate feminine to yin and masculine to yang because sometimes we switch bodies and there'll be a yin force in a, in, a, in a male body and a yang force in a female body. We go back we and forth to learn, I've, I've, I've learned. You're, you're saying we switch bodies? In reincarnation, yes, we don't always, we don't always reincarnate in in in. In, uh, if, if we're a yang force or a yin force, we don't always reincarnate in the same body. We we we, we do switch bodies same, to learn same, different things. You mean from the same? You mean the same gender? Experiencing different sexes. Right. No, I say, right. I we, think we I think we experience different sexes. I remembered a life of mine that I was a male, and uh, a, a couple lives of mine that I was a male. So no, I don't think we always stay in the same gender. No, I, 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 think, I, I'm not I think we have I, one I, I true gender. I don't think we stay in that gender all the time. What's your opinion? No, I, I agree. I agree. We 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 we're not always incarnating as as a, as a man or as a woman. And I'm not, you know, for some folks they can they can uh, incarnate as an animal or an insect depending upon their belief system. But that's not necessary either, unless of course you belong to a belief system that makes it so. Um, as far as uh, uh, responding within uh, within the polarities of, of gender demographic or gender dynamics, um, I think that that would depend on the person's ego, and that would depend on what the kundalini in the person uh, is is incurring within that person. So, if the kundalini wants you to respond in a in a yang sort of way, well, then it'll give you a reason to respond in a yang sort of way, and the same thing with a yin sort of way. Yang, for those that are not familiar, is means a, a, in a male way, and yin is a, in a female way, using the uh, the Chinese uh, descriptions of uh, sacred male, sacred femininity, yin and yang, uh, as you would see expressed on the symbol of the Tao. Right. So no, no. And receptive, more assertive and receptive in a sense, I think. One is giving and one is receiving, yeah. Right. Okay, we, we, we're we together on that point. <laughs> yeah. Did you have other, ask, other other situations? I'd like to ask you another question, uh, if you don't Please. mind, about a recommendation you made to me. You, uh, you do know I'm in the DNS and uh, going through a lot of emotional depression. You recommended... Um, I, t- I try a, a mystical tea, ayah- ayahuasca. 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 Yeah. Did you try that? No, because I looked it up, and if you're taking um, sedate, uh, anti-anxiety pills like I am, it could be deadly, according to oh, some yeah, of the. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you're if you're mixing, you know, you never want to mix meds, you know. So I would suggest that you get off the anti-anxiety pills first. I'm sure those are SSRIs. No, I'm no. It's just Xanax. I can't. I can't sleep. I, I. 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 Because of the whole what the Kundalini has taken me through. I. I. I cannot sleep without them now. Um, and uh, think about. And in think fact, about what you're saying. has an MAOI in it, basically, which yeah. is an antidepressant, but it also contains a serotonin base, which I'm pretty much finding I'm allergic to. So, I'm I. Uh, you're saying my, you're saying you're allergic to serotonin. Yeah. 
So you're allergic to something your body produces naturally? Oh, not serotonin, to the serotonin enhancers in the antidepressants. I'm not allergic to I'd serotonin. Say, I'd say I... you're probably allergic to the antidepressant rather than uh, the, 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 the constituents of the body that, that the antidepressant is using to manipulate a certain uh, reaction from you. Right. The MAO, the anti- MAO just means it goes through the blood-brain barrier, and it can get through the uh, the stomach. It can it can go through the digestion process. Uh, so you know you don't want to take uh, you know inhibitors if you're yeah you know if if it contraindicates uh, you know the the medicines that you're taking now. I'm pretty sure that you you mentioned that you were on meds last time. I I, I feel like I remember you mentioning something about Xanax. What I'm saying is that. Ayahuasca can, can can really shed some light on a on a dark night soul, which is what we're using the acronym DNS to uh, to describe. Um, they're very 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 positive results uh, in South America. Uh, I know one hospital that uses it exclusively to fight addictions from heroin to cigarettes to alcohol to to whatever the addiction is, so the the uh, ayahuasca is very positive for that. It's a Schedule D drug in the United States, so you can't get it in the United States. You have to travel. Um, or order but, it right online. No, no, no. You don't. Don't even do that. You don't. If you're going to take it, take it right. Do it with people who know how to use it, that have a track record of using it uh, effectively and safely with people. Don't just order it online uh, and and then go to Arrowwood Vault and and figure out a recipe to do it with. I, you know, it's different. It's not it's not a recreational thing. It's something that is very therapeutic and uh, it can really help a person inside of a DNS. I will not subtract the advice that I gave to you. I stand with that advice, but I also stand with with the aspect that. You go in there, you go in there pure. You're not addicted to Xanax. You're not addicted to anything else. Uh, you you do not need anything other than what the Kundalini has to tell you. Now, I, I understand that, that when you're having a hard time sleeping and, 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 you know, issues of that nature, that it can really put a, you know, a level of difficulty on your life that you're not used to or happy with. And so you'd be more than happy to take whatever drug the MD pushes at you to say, oh, here, this will make you sleep. But it maybe it doesn't help you on a kundalini level. Maybe that's what's helping you stay in a DNS, dark night soul. So look, look at what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. And if the, you know, if, if, if you can see that that uh, taking the Xanax is something that your Kundalini wants you to do, well, that's one thing. Then you do it, of course. There's no way around that. But if it's something that you're doing to counteract a a symptom that the Kundalini is giving you, well, that's you placing a control on the Kundalini. And that I will not counsel you to do. No, it's the, it's the first one in my case, I think. But I, I do appreciate... When you first told me to recommend that I take ayahuasca, however you pronounce that, you didn't mention that that I that I take it with uh, should take it to with experienced people. Though I do respect that now because it sounds like it could be quite dangerous on your ordering it on the internet and then and, and taking it on your own, which is what because you, you gave me no more direction at that point. It's a, it's, it's a it's a purgative. It's a purgative, so it makes you throw up. Okay, and so. You know, people will start throwing up and think that they've ingested some sort of a poison. Okay. And that's just a basic thing. I mean, in, in South America, it's called La Perga for that reason. And people begin to vomit energy. They they vomit up things that, that the body wants to be released. Or in, in your case, it would be your kundalini is vomiting up. Uh, energy that no longer serves the body anymore. And so you see a person having dry heaves. Well, if you can look with with other faculties, you can see that they're, they're not having dry heaves at all. It's a very productive uh, uh, um, 
<laughs> what do I say? It's a very productive uh, 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 purging. <laughs> purging. <laughs> It's just that it, you're seeing a lot of uh, negative energy coming out of that individual into that bucket. They give you a bucket, you know, for that reason. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You never, ever, ever, ever um, try to take, take a shortcut by just ordering something online. And, and, and unless you have direct experience with it already, uh, definitely seek out those uh, shamans in this case, like I have, I have a shaman. It's a friend of mine in in Peru, in in uh, Ucalpa, Peru, and and uh, his name's Ishmael. And Ishmael, you know, he'll his father is one of the most well known uh, ayahuasqueros in the region. And yeah, they it's a very safe uh, ceremony and. And I have taken students of mine there, and they've had very positive uh, experiences with that. And so Were I have no problem. Were you recommending that I go to Peru? You didn't mention that. Well, I mean, you know, in the in, the, in relationship with the DNS, um, it looks to me like before you go to Peru, uh, there needs to be some equilibrium given uh, between you and your Kundalini with regards to the Xanax. Well, the Xanax is, is the least of my. I, I've got I've got complicated health problems. Um, I, I mentioned chronic fatigue syndrome, but the the Kundalini sent me right into these into these um, health problems. I was under the Kundalini when I did certain things that that caused this problem, and uh, and it was the Kundalini that that took me here. And this is my DNS, and I don't know. Whether I am to submit to now, you know, the, the physical problems I have from from things that I did under the Kundalini's advice, or if there's a way out with Ayahuas, whatever that is, Ayahuasca, or whether there's not a way. What, out. what 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 the Ayahuasca will do is typically now this is this is just a typical thing, is it will isolate issues in your life that you need to to uh work on in order to to make your life uh more profoundly acceptable to the kundalini people get real people get their kundalini awakened sometimes by the ayahuasca uh people interact with the ayahuasca which is also called the vine of life uh, it will come to them in a in a very kundalini like way, and it will talk with them. It will come as a snake, as a very beautiful, beautiful bejeweled giant serpent, and that serpent will come right up to the person and start talking to them, telling them, you know, if, if you know, uh, say say somebody who's really wrapped in their ego, the uh, the the bejeweled serpent would say something like, "You don't know everything." Why don't you step over here and try learning once in a while? Literally, literally those words. Okay. The ayahuasca is just is a way for a person to bypass their ego and to directly communicate with their kundalini. Okay, well I've so, already I've already done that, I think. And uh I'm I'm suffering the consequences of where my kundalini has led me um and it's i i'm going to suggest marilyn that you're suffering the consequences of your ego resistance to where the kundalini has led you the kundalini does not make mistakes period no it has i'm not saying this is a mistake i think suffering teaches people compassion i yeah. think compassion maybe is something that I need to learn more of, and I'm not. I'm not sure that this is not where my just where my Kundalini wants me, rather than trying to get from you a, a way out of the DNS. Um, well, this, typically, the way out of the DNS is to stop resisting it, embrace it. Yeah. Yep, that's, that's it. Fixed. That'll do it. I mean, uh, 
you want to stay as healthy as you can. You want to to you know stay hydrated and and take care of of the nutritional requirements that the Kundalini will give you. Uh, I like the fact that you're trusting your Kundalini from the get go, which is very good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm questioning a little bit, Marilyn, just a little bit questioning about how you respond to what your Kundalini leads you to. You know, and what your you know what the ramifications are within your process of your responses and what your discernment of the appropriate responses are based in. How do you discern what the Kundalini has told you, number one, and number two, what the Kundalini is wanting you to do? How are you discerning that? Well, what what started this, um, and I was very much in the clutches of, of the Kundalini, of an active Kundalini, um, and I was, uh, I, I got cancer, and uh, I was undergoing chemotherapy, and at that time, I was a fan of fan of Andrew Weil, who was saying, "Stop the chemotherapy, don't do it anymore." And I was quite convinced that that's what I should do. So I was almost just about done, and I was ready to stop it. I had maybe two more to go, and the the the, the Kundalini was giving me messages through the I Ching and through my intuition. And each one is a divination tool, and uh, it said, by no means follow your prescribed course. And uh, it was, I, I felt it was telling me to to go ahead and complete the chemotherapy. Uh, as it turned out, I I had a flu uh, the last chemotherapy. My doctor was out of town, and the substitute doctor gave it to me anyway. And uh, I had a having had all this. Kundalini energy in me, uh, ner- nervous energy in me. It, it could not take, and and the flu and some other infections I had going. It could not take the chemotherapy, and uh, I I got very sick as a result. Um, and I'm still dealing with that that illness. But I felt that the Kundalini was saying, "Go ahead with it." Um, and I had two young children, so there was a reason not to argue with it at, at that point. Um, right. But uh, uh, now, that was now my... Using, using the I Ching as a, as a divination source, uh, you know, the, the I Ching can be, can be extremely accurate, but it is not, it is not, it, it will never come right out and say, don't do this or do that. It always no, makes you interpret it. picked up the... Picked up the the possible, yeah. They come they come up with actually six conflicting uh, responses, and it was the Kundalini in me that honed in on one of them. Okay. And, and so. Many times I found it was right on. This one, this you know, many times I could tell that was exactly what I was supposed to do. This one, th- this time, you know, it told me I was definitely supposed to follow the prescribed course which and the medical the medically prescribed course was to continue with the with the chemotherapy whereas Andrew Wire was saying drop it that would have been the um resistant way to go instead of just going surrendering to you know well the kundalini to to the chemotherapy and I did surrender to it and uh I got very sick which led to this this DNS now that I'm experiencing um and I feel – go ahead. So you're saying that you surrendered to Dr. Weil over the other doctors, right? No, I, I, no, I, I, I surrendered to the medical establishment, not to the, the controversial Dr. Weil, who was saying, don't, don't do chemotherapy. It can, it can hurt you. And medical establishment, the prescribed medical establishment was saying – You've got cancer. You do chemotherapy, and I had two young children, and 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 through the the Kundalini talking through the I Ching was 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 directing me towards towards the the selection that said follow the prescribed course, and uh, and I did that, but but not just with that. I mean, I the the, the I Ching spoke, helped guide me through the Kundalini process for the for the. 17 years that it was active in me by explaining what is going on. What does it say about your DNS? 
You know, it stopped talking to me at that time. <laughs> at, at the DNS is when I lost touch with the the Kundalini seemed to go back into its abode. Uh, I couldn't trust my intuition anymore. Um, why, could, why couldn't you trust your intuition? Because I, I it, it was lost. I couldn't. My, it had no. It didn't. It didn't select. I mean, normally when I would, you know, open the I Ching, it would give you six selections. One of them was kind of almost in red. You know, it was. It was just my my intuition went right towards it. That was what what it was saying. And uh, now I can pick up the I Ching, and and I can't. I get no. I get no lead on to it. Uh, I I I get no lead. Um, well, in a way, I think that's a good thing because. People have a hard time separating their ego from their intuition. And many times a person will call their intuition uh, something that their ego has, has devised. And, and so it can be a very, very, very slippery uh, slope when it comes to discerning between intuitive uh, guidance and guidance that is influenced by the ego. Okay, because we have fears and we have concerns and, you know, you had a couple of kids and, you know, there's a lot of pressure on a person inside of that type of a medical context to follow the mm-hmm. medical context within that. Mm-hmm. Um, it could have been just as easily a uh, an intuition that said follow the prescribed course that Dr. Weil was prescribing. Okay. I mean, you know, there's 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 room uh for for both for both uh, opportunities at that there, time. There is definitely room for error if you're not in the Kundalini. If you're in the Kundalini, I don't think there's room for error, as you say. It's a it's well, a you crisis. can resist. To me, that's an error. Resisting the Kundalini is an error, and I made right. a lot of errors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I am error expansive. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it takes it. It's a good subject that you bring up, uh, Marilyn. How do we discern what is ego, and how do we discern what is Kundalini intu- intuition? Typically, uh, the ego will be self-serving in some way. It will be self-serving in that it 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 allows a person not have to deal with fear. It allows a person not have to deal with pain. It has. It allows a person not to deal with discomfort. It allows a person to to step away from those areas that the Kundalini may be giving the person for a very, very important reason. I get a lot of people coming to me about pain. You know, you know uh, Kristen, would you take the pain in my shoulder away? Or, or Kristen, I have a, I have a, I have a, I have lower back pain, or I have cancer, or I have a tumor, or I have these these types of issues, and I get called to come to people to to help them with those issues. And I respond, especially, of course, when the Kundalini, you know, is, is positioning me in order to do that for other people. But to, dis- turn, to discern Kundalini from, from ego is basically look at the fruit of, of what the the answer of the person is going to be. So, for instance, if it's, if it's a, a medical thing, well, you know, let's say, well, okay, I, doctor says he wants to amputate my foot because of, of the necrosis that's there and the, and the, uh, the, the, the pain, the neuro- neuropathic pain that's occurring. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be getting better, and I've got type 2 diabetes and da-da-da-da, you know, and so I'm, the doctor wants to amputate my foot. Let me let me check with my kundalini here. Hmm. Hmm. Foot amputation. Foot amputation. Foot amputation. And the ego is going, no! No! Don't cut. Don't let him cut your foot off. Okay. The ego's yelling, don't let him cut your foot off. And the fear that amputation can bring, or cancer, or AIDS, or you know any kind of a, of of a of a of a severe medical situation can bring can blind a person and deafen a person to what the kundalini wants them to do okay so so you will you will you will make the choice not to get that foot cut off 
and the gangrene, you know, may may uh, kill you. Okay, so there are very hard choices that people within a medical uh, uh, environment have to deal with with regards to kundalini. Sometimes the kundalini brings that on as a karmic venue for burning karma that that person needs to get out of their system so that they can continue their kundalini within a balanced format. Uh, you know, with, with you, Marilyn, and the DNS, Dark Knight Soul, well, it's, I, I kind of see an obvious picture of the kundalini taking away uh, uh, systems of divination. Basically saying, no more divination here. You know, this, this may not have been the best uh, option. You know, no more divination. Let's Let's just bring it straight from the Kundalini, the divine, to Marilyn and see how she goes with it. And uh, and only you, Marilyn, only you know how you have gone with this and and whether uh, you are, in, in, in fact, uh, resisting the Kundalini by virtue of wanting more comfort or you are, you know, you are surrendering to the Kundalini no matter what and and trying to to change your response to life uh, in a way that is conducive to the kundalini furthering itself within you. I would have to choose the, the latter for you. If, if In my limited understanding of your situation, Marilyn, I feel that you are actually reaching out along a vector of approach that your kundalini uh, is going to find quite favorable and that your DNS has light at the end of that tunnel. That's what I'm feeling and seeing with you. And it's not because my ego is saying, oh, Marilyn, I want you to be better. It's not like that at all. It's just over the years I've learned how to go into a neutral space and see what the Kundalini wants for a person. And I see I see this is where you're drifting at this point. And I do feel it is a drift. It is. You're you're drifting into areas of discernment that the Kundalini wants you to understand, and so it, you know here you are talking about Kundalini uh, with a person that has a very specific way of interacting with the Kundalini, and in this case, it's going to be complete surrender to the Kundalini. Here, uh, if the Kundalini comes to you in your dreams tonight, and uh, you know, cuts through that Xanax fog and comes to you in your dreams and says, oh, run away from that Christian teacher. He's the worst. He's the worst. Read about him on the web, whatever. You know, and then I would say, well, yeah, you know, you might want to find a different teacher or a different person to listen to. On the other hand, if the Kundalini comes to you and says, you must take the teachings that Christian has given. He He's one of the few people out there on the web that's giving the truth the way the truth needs to be given. And you need to, to partake of those truths. Well, then I would suggest that you partake of those truths, Marilyn. And don't let your ego talk you out of it. Don't let friends or family or strangers talk you out of it. You pay attention to the Kundalini without tarot cards, without the I Ching, without Madam Blavatsky on the corner there, you know, reading palms. Nothing against reading palms or tarot or I Ching. I have used each of those systems, and they're effective, as is iridology and, the, and looking at the tongue and looking at the shape of the ear and, you know, looking at, you know, the, I mean, there are codes within codes of the physical human that are divination tools that I'm not going to go into right now. But without any of those things, the Kundalini obviously does not want you to have help in this way. It wants you to come at this organically, free range. And literally, I mean free range. It's giving you free range. Okay? Follow your intuitive guidance, not the guidance that allows you to... to uh, to resist. It's not yes, an easy I, thing. Thank you for that, and I and I respect what you say because every 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 just about every 
video I saw on uh, on YouTube was exactly what I was led to believe. I mean, you were right on what I felt from what was taught to me. On I just got everything. Um, but wow. right, but, you're the but one. Right, you're the one who's you're the one who's right on, Marilyn. You you right were able now, to make that, <laughs> You made that connection. So I've it's your put, Kundalini talking. I'm I'm in a severe depression. I'm in a physical depression and motivation. I'm I'm trying, but motivation's a problem. Um, well, let's talk about that a little bit then. Um, are you familiar with Saint Hildegard? Just a name. I didn't follow any of the readings. Saint, Saint any Hildegard is a Kundalini awakened uh, uh, nun in uh, in southern Germany. Uh, in the 10th century, uh, she she was amazing, just amazing, full-on kundalini. All the symptoms there. She wrote about them. She painted pictures showing the fire and showing you know the way that she was able to interpret this through the Christian teachings. Well, she put together a a compendium of of healthy uh, eating and living and exercising that is influenced obviously through the kundalini and the natural world and uh there is a well, I have one of my students uh has done an extensive uh, uh study of St Hildegard's uh remedies and they're all kundalini I mean the kundalini likes them and sh- there's a very specific uh uh, treatment that St. Hildegard, through her kundalini, uh, devised for people that are having depression. Uh, and uh, some of these things are like spelt beer, which is non-alcoholic, or spelt coffee, which is non-caffeinated. Okay, uh, there are other there are other some of the things based in spelt that that uh, that she prescribes, but there are other things too. And what I'm going to suggest you do, Marilyn, if you haven't already, I'm going to suggest that you join the Yahoo Kundalini Awakenings Systems One community. And uh, that student will be posting uh, St. Hildegard's remedies that, that she has found effective uh, in a, at a future time. And, and, uh, and I'll specifically have her post about depression for you, Marilyn. Thank you. I will and, do that. Um, and these 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 are these are Kundalini scent preparations for people. Okay. Now I'd like to add that although it is a physical depression I'm I'm in now, most of the depression was when my connection. I had a, a very strong Shiva Shakti connection, and I was in ecstasy for many for for. Many for, for for a full year, and then in a, a, a just very content c- cocoon of love, unconditional love between these two forces within me, uh, for 17 years. And it was when they left that the depression. You know, I, I don't know if it's the the depression is the physical depression that started actually more recently, or the depression that started. When the union of those two forces and the and the feeling of unconditional love surrounding me left me, I mean, I know the forces aren't gone, but my awareness of them is gone. Well, your your interpretation of of uh, of that bliss, you know, that I, I do tell people this, and, and I'm, I'm I'm once again I want to thank you for bringing that up. Is when bliss and ecstasy go away a person can fall into depression very, very easily because nothing can compare to bliss and ecstasy in the body. Nothing can compare to that. And so as soon as that sensation is gone, well, the person is going, oh, my gosh, what did I do to make Kundalini angry? And they slip into the, the – it can be the, the progenitor to a, to a dark night soul. Okay, dark night, dark night soul. Uh, so I will suggest that that is probably what slipped you into it. And that's a very, very, that's a very, very long time to have bliss and ecstasy. 
Um, not it was more. Touching. It was more. Uh, it became more of a blissful serenity. The ecstasy left after nine months. It was more of a a blissful serenity. A, a real uh, a it's loving. A, it's a very. It's a. That's a very very long time to have ecstasy. Uh, ecstasy uh, is best taken in small shots. Uh, yes, mine. Mine was a very unusual awakening. It was. It was almost impossible to find anything. Historically, other than Gopi Krishna, who had a resistance to it rather than surrender, as you say, uh, who, who had any kind of a, an experience that was mine, like mine. Although I did, I did recently find a woman who is, I guess her name. Let's see, her name was uh, Dorothy Walters. Uh, who yeah, yeah, also she's, in the, she's out here on the West Coast. Yeah. She was. I tried to get in contact with her, and she was sick and retired. But she had, she had a long-term Kundalini, although not as long as I mine by any means. Uh, and she, but she did describe the 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 a lot of what I experienced. She experienced it not for that long, um, but mine had a purpose, and it took me on that purpose. It took me out of a marriage that wasn't working. It it made it it had me with my scientific background, research the history of the Kundalini, the history of the evolution of consciousness, uh, and its relation to physics and metaphysics. Um, I, I had a mission, there was no doubt. And and uh, when I finished the book, when I finished the mission, is when the the, the marriage of those forces left me and, and propelled me into the DNS. Uh, oh, no, the... Well, maybe maybe so. Uh, as far as propelling you into the DNS, I'm not, you know, 100% uh, positive of a of a linear relationship. Uh, I could, I I would also uh, um, suggest that the lack, uh, just the lack of that bliss or ecstasy within you, can propel you into the DNS. It's not it's not them doing it to you so much as it it's a natural occurrence uh, for you to have and hold such strong divine emanation from you. There are certain things within you that need to be readjusted. There are certain attitudes that need to be changed. There are certain uh, levels of understanding that need to be transformed. Uh, there are certain levels of surrender that need to be obtained, and th- and I mean obtained without the assistance of a system of divination. Right, right. So, so I and think that, that is that brings us up to date with you, doesn't it? That's my DNS, and uh, it, it it's not just this lifetime because men. Spiritual men recognized before I did in me a light, uh, 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 some kind of a a spirituality that I didn't even know about um, at that point. And uh, it's a continuation from from prior lives. And going into the next one, I I feel this is a purification and uh, for for maybe what's going to come next. And I don't know... I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel this time like you do, though. I don't see it happening till till maybe the very end. It's uh, I could see the compassion I'm I'm developing from suffering so much, but I may have to develop deeper compassion from deeper suffering. You talk about experiencing in one of your videos experiencing the depths of human misery financially. Uh, Physically, emotionally, et cetera, and little by little, I seem to be facing those, and I don't know that I don't have to go deeper in those to to be able to get the full amount of compassion that a person can actually have I don't think well, with, a person... with 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 Kundalini, a person is touched by divinity or touched by God and as that touch actuates a transformation upon the physical and etheric uh, anatomies of that person, their ability to to have greater quantities of 
love and compassion and tolerance and patience and discipline are increased quite a lot. And so I would suggest that that if you are indeed being led into areas of greater compassion, that you will have and hold those greater levels of compassion or you wouldn't be allowed to go there. Your Kundalini, your Shakti Shiva are still massively in charge of your process. Uh, their absence just gives your ego something to hang on to with regards to abandonment, issues of being abandoned. And uh, you have not been abandoned. You just are not being given the same dynamic in teaching that you've received in the past, i.e. Uh, being given uh, the option of divination. And uh, it sounds to me like you use divination quite a bit uh, during your, your earlier uh, experiences with the Kundalini and the fact that this divination has been removed from the equation indicates that that uh, more of a personal less outside to inside approach is is to be taken by you uh, more of an inside approach first rather than taking information from an outside source and applying it to your inner situation I still don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> well, you may not. You may not be allowed to see that light. The expectation that you would be allowed to see that light is another thing for you to look at. Why should you be allowed to see that light if, you, if you're not allowed to to uh, to use divination or to, you know what purpose of you not seeing that light is is actually helping your equation rather than hurting it. Maybe for you to see the light, you would see the light and interpret that as the end of the DNS when, in fact, you may not be scheduled for an end of the DNS, you know, in, in the timeline that you would expect. Maybe your right. DNS has more to teach you. Right, but it, it, it does bring up then more fear, which I try to I try to combat with. You know, it's only one life. It doesn't really matter which way it goes. The next one could, you know, this it one does can matter. go very badly. Can it, it can? It, it does. It does it, matter, Marilyn. It matters. Every life, every expression, matters. Yes, Your it life does matter, but it doesn't. You have to take a more eternal viewpoint in terms of, of what you're learning. I mean, I may have to learn the depths of 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 the various areas you you mentioned um this lifetime in order to be able to do whatever I have to do next lifetime. I mean, it's well, it's well, a con- every every I just want to make the point. Every lifetime is hugely important. It is a divine gift. Having life itself is a divine gift. And so you can't minimize the importance of life or a lifetime. This is the only life that you will ever get being the person you are right now. So you don't get to repeat this. Okay? Marilyn, uh, the, the, the person who she is, this is the only time she gets to be this person. Then I want out. <laughs> well... You know that's that's a that's a that's a choice that you have to make, but I'm going to suggest that you won't you won't you won't continue to think along these lines. That I I feel that that you're going to be able to to come into a greater level of appreciation of what's occurring for you, and uh, you know buttressed by the experience of having Shakti Shiva. Uh, joined within you for almost a year, uh, that's a long time for that to occur. So no accidents. And it's no accidents that you're having the DNS the way you're having it and that, you know, you're looking at suicide as as a possible uh, uh, cure-all, and it's not. You know, it'll just set you back, and you'll just have to do it again. Um, and think about that. Think about these 17 years that you would have to do again. The 17 years were good. It's these, the past two and a half that are bad. And yes, I've already, I've thought about that and, and rejected it and 
and your video was, was came at a nice time. I mean, even though I rejected it, your video was a nice reassuring one on the Kundalini and suicide, just in terms of the turmoil I was going through and wanting out, even though I had decided that I didn't want to come back and do it again. So I, I wasn't going to totally take that relate. choice. I can totally relate to you on that level. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't want to have to come back and repeat any of it. Okay, I just keep going forward and forward, and the Kundalini because you know this is like the second or third time I've had it in a, in this in a body. It'll follow me through death, and it'll reincarnate with me again, as as I require it or as I choose to uh, to come back into a body in order to help other people have it. Um, which, which is basically what's been happening. So Marilyn, now, now, I, I hope this has given you some comfort, some level of of information uh, that can be helpful to you. It has, and uh, I want to say that I I ordered your movie on uh, the Kundalini, the one that you worked on. And I really, really enjoyed it. I was just so pleased to see something like that in video, in a, in a movie format, in in a public format. Uh, I was ecstatic to see that. I did, if I'm not monopolizing this too much, if you don't have too many questioners waiting, I did have one question about that movie. And uh, Sure, what you got? What is it? I didn't see the one to one. I, I understand why you did it this way, um, but the the one to one relationship that you seem to to match up between out of the body experiences and Kundalini. I know out of the body experiences is something that people have experienced more commonly than Kundalini, and they can relate to. And if that's why you made such a one to one match. I can see that. I don't see an exact one-to-one match between an out-of-the-body experience and a Kundalini awakening. Out-of-body experiences are are precursors often uh, to a Kundalini awakening experience. The uh, the idea that we can uh, see ourselves sleeping. You know, I've had plenty of OBEs, so. You know, I have that reference point. When you see yourself sleeping, well, that looks like you're dead. You know, you're trained to feel that, well, okay, uh, you know, when I die, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the body. I'm going to float up to heaven. Well, if you're floating up and you turn over and you see yourself sleeping there on the bed, well, you know, many people are going to say, oh, I guess I'm dead, you know, and off you go. And then, of course, you wake up the, the next morning and you're not dead. There is no one-to-one comparison ratio for Kundalini versus an OBE. Uh, they're apples and oranges. They're just apples and oranges that happen to to have similarities. They're both fruit. They both have seeds. They both grow on trees, things of that nature. Uh, an OBE uh, is preparing the person to realize that they're more than their physical body. And so it's like a preschool for kundalini because when you have kundalini well then you know there is something more to you than just a physical system uh with with the obe not only are you able to see that you are more than your physical body but you're also able to interact often with uh different spiritual consciousness or entities which i never suggest but it happens a lot and in my early experiences with the obe's you know, I was I was gifted in a way because if if you read uh, 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 Robert Monroe's work, and I suggest people do, it's called Journeys Out of the Body. Robert Monroe, uh, you know, he he would be helped by the by just hands, just a, a pair of hands would materialize and help him, and that way you see no face, you see no body, you see no. You don't see anything but the hands, and this is what would do. This is what happened for me as well. The hands would would appear, and they would grab me by the shoulder, or you know, they would take me to an to an experience that I needed to have in order to mature uh, spiritually, the way uh, you know I was being guided to mature. And the the you know, if you look at the separation sequences between the OBE 
and the Kundalini. The separation sequence is very similar. Uh, did I hear somebody snoring? Is somebody snoring on this line? Centaur, are you snoring? Jesus. <laughs> oh, no. You're snoring, aren't you? You're snoring. I am not. I am on mute. That's not me. <laughs> Maybe a tiling. <laughs> a rosemary. <laughs> or who else is there? <laughs> People listen. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I'll try to spice it up a little bit here. Uh, the, the separation sequence, uh, when the when the spirit is leaving the body for an OBE, uh, has one to one comparison with spastic kriya activity, i.e., you feel a lot of energy in the spine. You can you you can feel that the body is shaking. There's a level of vibration that goes from the head to the toes and back and forth into a very strong frequency. A uh, person can hear a loud noise or, or, or a, you know, a, a, a thunder, or, you know. You know, there, there are different mechanisms that the body uses to communicate the OBE separation sequence to the individual. And this, this allows a person to realize that, oh, my gosh, there's some very powerful energy in my body when I try to, to, to OBE. These are what I'm feeling. And so, yeah. Although it doesn't prepare you directly for Kundalini, it prepares you for the idea of Kundalini, awakening in the body. And you're correct. Not Most of the people that have OBEs will not have a Kundalini awakening experience, but some of them will. And some of them go right into it. Right into I think it. in my case, I must have had the OBEs in a prior life. I, I, I don't have anything like that this time. And I think I think that may be the case that you say it, it is preparing them, but again, I see one life and the next life is a continuum, and maybe it's maybe it's a it's a preparation for the next life when they will deal with when they will have a Kundalini awakening. But um, well, 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 this life is definitely a preparation for the next one. But try not to be so linear. Uh, try not to think of this life as a you know, A plus B equals C, okay, because you don't know the extent of your karma or how far back it goes or what you need to do, okay? I'm finding out, and I don't like it. <laughs> well, watch watch this level of divination that you have of, about collecting information that, shall we call, we can call that information, unsecured information, Okay, uh, I don't suggest people with Kundalini go to palm readers, tarot readers, uh, rune readers, or uh, mediums or any. No, uh, uh-uh. uh I, I would no, strongly. No, but if they can do it them, they might find that they have an abil- a suddenly awakened ability to do to read them the, the, the divination tools them, themselves, which is what. I oh found. no, I'm not, I'm not discounting that, but I'm also. You know, I'm also looking at the level of ego involvement there. You have to find a place to go neutral so that your ego doesn't jump in and flavor an interpretation. Right, and that would depend, I imagine, at the, on the strength of the Kundalini awakening at the time. As... No, not necessarily. Uh, you have to make the choice that you're not going to allow ego to ruin an interpretation, and that is a choice that you make. Now, sure, the Kundalini is there, and it's it's watching you go through your your uh, your your options, but it may not be controlling uh, the choice you make in your options. You know, in my situation, I was I was very aware of getting the ego out and trying to listen for, which is why it was effective to me because I was able to do that, and it was. I was able to take out my ego and and wait wait for the sign, <laughs> and uh, I don't use it anymore. But I think that I think I would have gone crazy if I didn't have that as a teaching tool. Uh, when I had nobody and I checked on the internet that time, and there was no internet, <laughs> there was no Kundalini on the internet in ninety one, and. Uh, I if I didn't have that as a teaching tool, I would have gone crazy. But uh, well, you've you done well, then. That, I'm sure. You've done well. 
and I want to encourage you to to do well. But the thing that I'll encourage you to do the most is to surrender completely to the Kundalini, especially during your dark night soul. Try to get off as uh, any of the meds as you can that that uh, your doctor and you decide that you no longer need. Uh, see see what you can do to mitigate that level of resistance. Um, if you don't sleep, maybe you don't need as much sleep. CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, is often a byproduct of resistance to the kundalini. Okay. And sa- same same goes for fibromyalgia as well, which I hope you don't have. I did. It's gone. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, can I? Is, do you have other questions that I can help you with? Not today, and I thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid I will have some more questions, but I, I really do enjoy well, your, just talking to someone your, who has. Your, question, your questions help others. Have you met? Let me just ask you personally: Have you met people in the Western world that have? Received your level of Kundalini awareness, which no, not is yet. like Glenn. Glenn Morris had a strong frequency, but it was only so high due to his martial arts uh, programming. Uh, he had an assistant uh, named Susan. Somebody, I forget her last name. She had she had awakened Kundalini, but and she had this uh, this. Uh, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, reputation for burning pineal glands, for frying pineal glands, and and so I invited her to fry my pineal gland one time, and you know it just it just never worked because I didn't realize at the time that I had a very high frequency of Kundalini, and that you know it was going to really, really, really put me through the mill which it did. But uh no, I haven't met a person that is that does what I do or that does what is done through me yet. I'm hopeful that there are people out there that are that way, but I have not met them and I don't see them doing anything on the web that is close to what I'm doing. No, I haven't either and it's been a for me, it's been a lonely, a very lonely voyage. I've alienated a lot of people by bringing up the subject of Kundalini. <laughs> but, uh, join, join the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for for being one. Thank you for being one. <laughs> and thank you for being one as well, Marilyn. And thank you for calling in with your questions. And I, I sign off here. I'm sure there's other people that need to monopolize your time. So thank you very much <laughs> for your time. <laughs> You're very welcome, and of course, you weren't monopolizing. Um, but that does leave us with uh, 11 minutes, and uh, I want to thank Marilyn for calling in and and uh, uh, talking about her uh, Kundalini Awakening experience. And I'm sure some of you can really resonate with some of her symptoms, and you know this this prolonged DNS that she's a current that she's having. And I do want to uh, uh, once again, I want to say about Saint Hildegard that she has put together preparations that are natural, not a single pharmaceutical in them, that are natural and that can work hand-in-hand with your Kundalini Awakening uh, equation. Seriously, look at St. Hildegard. Uh, It's kind of hard to find information on her in the States, Uh, more so in Europe. So uh, for those of you that will be coming to the seminar in Dublin, I'll be – talking about and showing you some of uh, St. Hildegard's products that's, you know, for depression or for, you know, any of the kundalini awakening symptoms that the human body may may uh, resonate with uh, without resisting the, the, the kundalini equation. That's the, that's the real caveat here. When you take the Hildegard uh, nutrition, You're not resisting your kundalini. It was built by a kundalini-awakened person for people 
that were of a very, very strong spiritual nature, if not kundalini active. Okay, so you can have positive response to DNS uh, formula by partaking of, of some of her products or or by by going down to Peru or going to Brazil or or somewhere where there's a safe uh, society and uh, uh, doing the uh, ayahuasca uh, ceremony it's a ceremony it's a it's a deeply spiritual religious ceremony that the people do uh, with the ayahuasca and it, and it just makes so much sense from a kundalini perspective uh, I have done uh, the ayahuasca myself I did it in a way of course that I never advised people to do it and uh, I you know it's it, it's for me it was all kundalini phenomena that I was experiencing with it uh, and this this is also uh, uh, reiterated by some of the students that I that, that went down to Peru with me first we went to Brazil to John of Gods and uh, Amelia Centara was with us there, weren't you, Centara? I was indeed. I didn't get to go to Peru though that time, so maybe in the future, Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have a DNS. Um, but yeah, and so after John of God and you know seeing what how he's working over there, we went straight over to Peru, and then uh, we did a, about a three-day fast prior to to the ayahuasca ceremony and and uh people had very very positive experiences with it uh so i i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say do it here in the united states because of course it's a class d drug because of the uh, dea and them not understanding what it actually is or, or choosing not to understand but you can go to Peru, you can go to Brazil, you can go to uh, probably most of the countries in the South America, and you can find people that have been practicing with the ayahuasca for thousands and thousands of years. I could go into this, uh, but I don't think we have the time in this program. Maybe on another program, if people are interested, I will do a program strictly on the ayahuasca. And uh, we can go from there. Um, it looks like. Well, I'd like to say hello to to Eileen. Uh, Eileen, I'd like you to come online here. Hello. I'm. Hi, I'm here. Hi, everybody. This is Eileen Loro, and she's been with uh, Kundalini Awakening Systems uh, pretty much ever since it started. And so, I first of all, Eileen, I'd like to say thank you for the support and the uh, the helpfulness that you've given to many, many, many people over the years as the ambassador uh, of of our program for the public. So thank you for that, Eileen. You're welcome, Prism. It's been a pleasure. Well, I would also like to uh, introduce Eileen as the the person responsible for for Getting the CDs out. I have a CD. It's a sacred CD. It's it's uh, it was put out by the Kundalini. You can hear and feel the Kundalini within it. And uh, Eileen, can you go ahead and give the details of of what the CD is all about? Yes, I will. Uh, the CD is called Kundalini Sacred Music. There are seven songs on the CD, as well as about a twenty minute discussion of the safety. Um, the music was written by Shakti through Chrism. And it's used, I use it personally as a meditative uh, CD. Um, if you're interested in receiving this or purchasing it, uh, you can send me an email at elaurel55 at yahoo.com. That's E L. O R O five five at yahoo dot com, and I will send you the information. Um, one thing I want to say about the safety discussion: I listen to this tape or the CD often, and every time I listen to it, I learn something new. 
and I have heard it many, many times, and I've read the safeties many, many times, but there's always a little something different uh, that's given on this uh, CD. So if you are interested, send me an email at ELORO55 at yahoo.com, and I will tell you um, how to proceed. It's $15. That includes shipping in the U.S., Overseas, it's a little more. It depends on the country. So uh, I'll be glad to give you the information. Well, thank you, Eileen. Okay. Thank you. You're yeah. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Santara, do you have anything you'd like to say towards the end of the show here? Um. If I could again, could, um, I'd like to just say a little bit about the seminar, just give the, the details again. It's happening in Dublin on the 18th, 19th, and 20th of October. Um, if you have any inquiries, contact me at kundalinimatters at gmail.com or you can phone me on 00353. Oh, um, sorry, let me say that again. 003538 zero two nine seven six seven six and we begin at um seven o'clock on the Friday and we go right through until Sunday at four o'clock. So do contact me for details about that. That's all and I just I'd just like to say thank you as well to Marilyn for for ringing in because I think what she has brought up and the conversation between the two of you um is very helpful very helpful indeed for I'd say lots of people that are listening. And I, so I would you, also Marilyn. like to I would like to thank Marilyn as well and and all of you, Rosemary, Eileen and everybody that's that's on the uh the thing. Let me see, we have Julie still here and and a few other folks looks like they're still here. Um matter of fact I will be talking about the ayahuasca next week. So if there's anybody interested in hearing uh, a Kundalini teacher's take on ayahuasca ceremonial usage. Uh, tune in uh, next week uh, at 3 o'clock on this day. I would like to thank uh, Amelia Santara. I would like to thank Eileen Loro, Glenn Ola for putting up the website. I would like to thank all of you for listening live, Julie and, and uh, many of the different guests with all their different numbers. Thank you for listening live. I would like to uh, to uh, thank the Kundalini Shakti and Shiva for making this program uh, available to you. And I would like to thank uh, Amelia Centara and her family for putting up the money and, and arranging uh, for this uh, blog talk radio system. Uh, to relay this information to you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I will talk with you about the ayahuasca at next week this time. Bye-bye. <laughs>